Thank you very much. Thank you again for um, bringing me here. I'll give a Blackboard talk, worked on Monday. So <laughs> um, let's start with something very classical. Asymptotic co completeness in quantum mechanics. So you have h is minus Laplace plus v. You assume that v is, of course, real valued and decays nicely at infinity in some sense. Short range condition, typically, like in Agmon's paper. And then you look at this linear evolution problem. And even though it sounds simple and natural, it took a long time to prove the following theorem. Um, again, under assumptions on V, short range assumptions say, you have only finitely many eigenvalues. That's if V decays faster than an inverse second power. Negative eigenvalues can be 0 too. Then the solution, that's the theorem, that the solution becomes a superposition of and then you have here, I suppose with this sign, um, so this is this famous asymptotic completeness result. As time tends to infinity, the solution disintegrates into the bound states, the trapped states, these here. These are the localized guys. And then you have a free Schrodinger wave, and you have little o1. So the, in classical mechanics, of course, the analog of this. So psi zero is not. Uh, phi zero is some L2 function. So that's And you can use. Yeah, yeah. So V is a nice. So let's be technical here. Let's write down when you can prove this. Um, say V is, of course, real valued so that you have a self agent operator. So I'm making a fairly strong assumption here, bigger than 2. Um, so that I have only finitely many negative eigenvalues, and it's a finite sum. And you do this in three dimensions? Three, well, you can do this in any dimension. Oh. Two is a critical number, but it's not really the for this. But below two, if you decay more slowly, you can have an infinite series. You can have infinitely many, like in Coulomb, you have infinitely many negative eigenvalues. So But the linear problem, so I was going to say, and this is perhaps unnecessary for this audience, if you have the Newtonian analog of this, you compare, of course, this perturbed evolution under a decaying um, potential V, force, grad V, to that of the free Schrodinger trajectory, uh, sorry, <laughs> free Newtonian trajectory. So um, Y of T would be Y0 plus TV. And then you have your, let's use some, I want to use a color I can erase. So you have some other trajectory. That's the x trajectory. And then you want, at the same time as time tends to infinity, this to go to 0, both for y and x and y dot x dot. That is the classical analog of what the quantum asymptotic completeness means. All right. And there are two ways to see this, that for every free trajectory, Newtonian, you can find a perturbed one that does this, and vice versa. One is existence of wave operators. The other is um, asymptotic completeness. Be it as it may, we're not concerned here with the linear scattering theory. We're really concerned with the nonlinear analog. So nonlinear analog, is that, is that a much easier uh, statement than? I'm sorry, the, the which? It's this analog for, of, of that. 
under the conditions that you have? Is it usually much simpler? <laughs> no, so classical scattering theory is not necessarily easy. You construct the classical wave operators, and so you sort by a contraction principle. Yeah. And you see, of course, that um, what do you really need? You need integrability, but twice in time of this. Right. So you would want v to decay faster like than minus 1, so that this decays faster than minus 2. But after I have that, then it's straightforward to do this, is There is a book by Dereshinsky Gerard, for example, where they present all of this very cleanly, and they make some kind of micro-local connection between the classical picture and the quantum picture. You have these Isosaki kitada parametrices, it's this micro-local way, but they are mostly concerned with long range. Long range means that v, yeah, yeah, yeah. that v of x decays like this. Alpha is just bigger than zero, but then you d ask that derivatives you always gain. It's like a symbol class. Yes, so the is just a, it's from the 90s, I think, but around 2000. So a nice reference for all of this is We will do something um, quite different. We will look at a nonlinear analog, which really does not exist. But what I'm trying to tell you is a few instances in which we have a similar soliton resolution type property. So you can view this as a decomposition of your wave into solitons and the radiation that carries the energy off to infinity, right? So when can you? Um, expect something similar. So let's schematically, um, I should be consistent with my signs, schematically look at a nonlinear problem. And so n of psi is some nonlinearity you want it to be gauge invariant. So for example, you can take the typical semilinear nonlinearity right, without gradient terms. And then, soliton resolution would say something like this, that you would want psi of t to be the sum of stationary guys. So what would stationary solutions be? They would be the elliptic solutions to the elliptic PDE, right? So you want this to decompose into a bunch of these guys. So say you have here finitely many solutions of this equation. Call them phi j. Yes, yes, yes. We can. You will see examples of this. I'm just trying to yeah. set the stage here. But there is, of course, a symmetry group acting on that. We just mentioned gauge freedom, which just means that psi goes to e to the i gamma psi. You want that to be invariant under this gauge, right? I'm sorry, the which? No, 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 gamma is a fixed number. This equation is invariant under just this. Ah, 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 ah. Yes, 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 you have a good point that you would want, sorry. You may want to include, absolutely, you want an oscillation. So, yeah, sorry about that. Yes, yes. So that's very important, in fact. I was thinking of the wave equation where you don't necessarily do that. Yeah. So you have these. And this equation isn't just gauge invariant. There's a larger symmetry group acting, the Galilei transform. So you would want the Galilei transforms relative to um, some parameters, right? In three dimensions, how many parameters would there be in the full generality at Galilei transform? has six parameters, and then you have gauge freedom, and then you have another one, a dual one. So you would have eight, eight parameters in three. Um, so what's the dual one? Yeah, OK, that's, that comes from a mass. You can change the mass, which is related to this. Right. All right. Okay. Um, so GJT, I subsume the Galilei transform in this notation, and that acts on phi j. And as Svetlana said, I should then make them oscillate. And I would have 
now an H1 datum here, free datum with free Schrodinger, and little o1 in H1. All right, and this might be your asymptotic description of your solution as time tends to infinity. All right, we do not have in general anything like this. In the completely integrable case, yes, you have inverse sketching transformed, but in general, so you're not completely integrable. You don't have that. Um, I guess we have a many-body version of this statement. We have, we have a linear operator. To some extent, the nonlinear theory should be an effective theory that arises from the many-body. Possibly. So you want to think of bosons, fermions, this mm -hmm. type? So yeah. Okay. This, I guess, I guess it's called the Gross-Pedevsky equation when T is equal to with a special nonlinearity, cubic nonlinearity. Then you can derive it from the many body. Yeah, yeah, but um, so are you saying that from the many body linear theory you can prove solid and resolution for the nonlinear model? I'm not saying to prove that. I'm just wondering that there it's known. It's somehow a more fundamental theory. But yeah. But okay. you have it. There's, there's no solid time resolution theory for many body theory. But there are these clusters that go out, and they should correspond. That's to for a finite dimension. You don't have any infinite dimensional scattering. That would you would have to do some field theory for that. There is some right. there is some result for that. But that's uh, that's beyond what what's known. Okay. I'm not sure we need to find infinite. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Let's stay on the sure. on the earth. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can. There is an analog of this heuristic that for the wave equation. Let me actually tell you what's known rigorously and that's what this talk is about for the longest time really nothing was known outside of completely integrable but there's this ver very remarkable DKM theory from around 2012 this is DKR forgive my pronunciation Um, Doikert's Kenigmel theory, which applies to a very specific equation. And now let's be in, we'll look at the wave equation in one plus three dimensions. And it's UTT minus Laplacian U minus U to the five is zero. So you may say, why this equation? Um, that's a very special equation. It has a conserved, first of all, there is something called local well posedness theory that I cannot really go into here. What you do know is that if your data are in h dot 1 of R3 cross L2 of R3, then you have local well posedness for this problem. Okay. This is a, this is a focusing. Yes, very important that this is a focusing sign, which makes everything interesting. If you were to put the plus sign here, that doesn't mean that that's easy, but that's from the late 80s, 90s, Grilakis, Michael Struve. They settled um, the defocusing case um, via so-called Morovitz inequalities, where you show that in this particular case, first radial and then non-radial, you cannot have any kind of singularity formation. You have global existence in time. But I'm really perhaps getting ahead of myself a little bit. If you've never seen this before, I should build up a little bit to that. Um, first, let's look at the conserved energy. This is a wave equation, so you have a conserved energy. When I write vector u, I mean u comma u dot, time derivative, so always in phase space u u t. This is conserved. This depends on t and x. And let me retain these signs. So the, the logic is this is a positive operator. And then if you take, you write that u5 as u4 times u. And u4 is a positive potential, right? Albeit the time dependent one. Um, so you would have this conserved energy for as long as your solution exists. Okay. If you take the plus sign, you note that 
nothing here, there is no competition. Nothing can go to infinity, right? On the other hand, if you take the minus sign, it can happen that the kinetic part goes to infinity and this potential part goes to the infinity at the same time. Why is this called critical? Because you have the embedding h dot 1 of R3 embeds into L6 of R3. Um, this just means that f in L6 of R3 is bounded by L2 of R3, right? And this is a scaling invariant statement. And what's the natural scaling? f lambda x would be root lambda f of lambda x. This is the scaling that leaves L6 and h dot 1 invariant in R3. If you lower this power, so if you were to write, for example, u cubed, in fact, in that case, um, it's not so well understood, okay, the subcritical case for the pure wave equation. If you add a mass term, if you write plus u, then all the scattering theory is known. Okay, but it's, it's a very delicate thing that nobody knows what the scattering theory is of that if you put u cubed there. And that's kind of intimately connected to the reason that um, we have soliton resolution, at least radially, for this problem, but not subcritically without the mass term. Okay? So the theory for this is called the defocusing, that's called focusing. We have a satisfactory understanding up to power 5, meaning up to power 6 in the energy, with a plus sign. We know that if you take um, data, So let's stick to exactly power 6, OK? So power 5. If you take data in h dot 1 cross L2, then you have global existence and scattering to a free wave. Okay? And if you take smooth, compactly supported data, then your solution stays smooth and with a compact support expanding by finite propagation speed for all times. All right? These things we know. When you put the minus sign, some things can happen. The dynamics is much more subtle. And the reason for this is you can look for solutions that might seem strange at first. They don't depend on x. You get an ODE. You get v double dot minus v5 is 0. And then you make this ansatz that v of t um, is constant t to the minus alpha, say. You say solve this backward in time, from positive time to zero. And you will see that the law that you need to obey, this becomes minus alpha minus 2. This has to balance t to the minus 5 alpha. So you see that if you adjust this constant, you will have a solution that blows up like 1 over root t, right? And now you will complain to me, correctly so, that this is a bad example because it has infinite energy. We want to keep everything of finite energy. And that's true, but that's very easy to circumvent. You just take, um, first of all, you don't blow up at time 0, say. You blow up at time big T. And for all intents and purposes, we can make big T 1, but let's keep that. So we know that there is a solution with a constant that I'm too lazy to compute. And so this is a solution that would, to some extent, blow up at time capital T. And now what you do is you just run um, a light cone back. You mult multiply what you get for v and v dot at time 0. So this is time capital T. This is time 0. You multiply this by a smooth bump function, which is 1 on this ball, all right? That would be 0 in three-dimensional space, radius t, all right? You take this as data. Then by finite propagation speed, you know that the true solution has to, for as long as it exists, has to agree with this solution inside of this light cone. It's constant, though, you're saying. You made it well, it's not constant. It'd be, yeah. it'd be, yeah, it's this inside of here. It agrees with that. 
So it blows up at the latest at this what time. What I'm saying is it has no, uh, so, 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 so the point is the Laplacian doesn't contribute, right? The Laplacian does not contribute to this guy. And then at least heuristically, and I really owe you an explanation, but I cannot give it to you so easily. You need to know what Strichel's estimates are and how the well positiveness theory works. What you have to compute is you have to compute, for example, an L8 norm um, in T and X of your solution for as long as it exists. So call this nonlinear guy U. So then you compute that. But for time here, this is X. And we take, um, let me see, I take this. And then I go up to here. And I get L8 in X. This is only one of several so-called Strichert's norms. You can take L5 um, TL10X also works. And you will convince yourselves that this has to be infinite. Because if you compute that, and I'll bite my tongue if it's not true, but if you compute that, it's at least as big, you see, as this. Do you understand? So, sorry. <laughs> this guy has to be this inside of the shaded region uh, for as long as it exists. Claim, if you plug this guy in here and you compute, so what do you have to do? You take um, the volume of this ball, which is of radius that. So then the volume is this. All right? OK. And you, you get 3 eighths minus a half. Ah, that works because 3 h is less than 4 eighths, right? <laughs> so you blow up in finite time. And so this, this you get from the so-called well positiveness theory, which says that if such a strange norm remains finite up to some time, then you can continue the solution beyond that time. I should throw in here something that's really an embarrassment to the field. But if you replace this 6 by an 8, so you make it super critical. There is no theory. There is no global theory. There is a local theory. But we do not know if you take smooth, compactly supported data with the u to the 7 wave equation with a plus sign, then you might expect or not. I don't know. Nobody even has a good conjecture, I think. Even in the radio case, right? Even in the radio case, where you could only have singularity formation at the origin. But uh, for that, for the u to the 7 problem, that singularity formation would have to be somehow slow. It would have to be like a minus one third power. That's the natural power. In. So we don't know anything about the scattering problem, the global existence problem for supercritical equations. Very simple model, radial, as Tom said. Yeah? We don't know. But so for the minus u to the 5, we see that you have, can have finite time blow up for large data. On the other hand, by the Strichert theory, which is some simple, well, simple. It's a very well-established classical theory by now. You have global existence and scattering for small data in H.1 cross L2. So you have this dichotomy. Small data, everything's fine. And you scatter to a free wave. All the, the energy is small and radiates off to infinity. But as we showed by means of this example, um, you can have finite time blow up. What's more, there is an elliptic object in the background. Just like here, there are elliptic objects, right? And what's our elliptic object? It's the extremizer of this Sobolev embedding. And what's remarkable is that this extremizer is, is explicit. There's this function Wx. Isn't that nice? So this decays like 1 over r. It is the extremizer of this Sobolev embedding. So it gives you the optimal constant. It attains the optimal constant. But it's not the only one, of course, because of this scaling. So it belongs to a one-dimensional over the radial class family of extremizers, which are w lambda of x, root lambda w lambda x. Agreed? And so these all solve minus Laplace w minus w5 is 0. And in analogy, if you want, with such a logic, which however is incomplete, because here we just assume that you have Galilei invariances, or over the wave equation, you would put Lorentz transforms here, right? But 
you might also have conformal symmetries. We do have here, right? And you have them here. The scaling is a conformal symmetry. It's not, it's not a true Lorentz symmetry. And so what's the theorem by Deuchert's koenig mel It says, and again, it's around 2012. It says that um, it's a lot to write down. But any radial solution of um, box u, that's u dt minus Laplacian u, minus u five zero is one of one of the following. So one is this is called the type one blow up. Type one meaning that the h dot one cross L two norm goes to infinity in finite time. Okay? So you have type one blow up in finite time. I.e. h dot 1, and I'm in 3 plus 1 dimensions here. The theorem is sensitive to the dimension. First of all, in dimension 1, 2, there is no critical equation, <laughs> because all powers are subcritical. 3 is the first dimension where you have a critical transition, subcritical to supercritical. But they also can't go too high in the dimension. Let's just stick to 3. Um, h dot 1 cross L2 in 3D tends to infinity in finite time, as t tends to t, which is finite. All right? That's finite time law. Or u is global. Number three, u is type 2 blow up in finite time. But before I do that, let me tell you what they can say. Global means it just scatters to the. Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, you have solid on resolution. If you're okay. global, you become, you look like that. Oh, okay. You use the W and the conformal symmetry. The Lorentz symmetry is gone because you're in radial, in the radial class. Sorry, the conformal symmetry is only there when you're critical. Very good point. Um, we have to discuss that. So not quite. If you <coughs> change the power, you will have a different kind of scaling. But when you become subcritical, and that's the main point of my talk, is you add a mass term. Otherwise, you don't have solitons. That's because of so-called Bohosayev identity, which means integrating by parts against x dot grad. OK? That's a fundamental thing. When I was a postdoc at Princeton, Avi Sofa would tell me that people have made their careers in PD integrating by parts against x dot grad. Okay? It's like more of its identity. Um, X dot grad is absolutely fundamental because yeah. scaling, yeah, it's the generator of scaling. Mm -hmm. But okay, so let's get back to your point. But what is what do they they show? They show that in phase space, U T and I'm suppressing the variable X becomes a finite superposition of these W's with the conformal symmetry, but of course, just like we allowed the this to depend on time, your rescaling depends on time. So you have lambda j of t, you don't know the sign. Um, this is just a function of x, time is acting here, zero. So that's very important that you have a zero. You're in phase space. So this is u, u t of t and x. And in this slot, that's actually a very important point of this theory, that in the time slot, somehow you, that doesn't carry energy. OK, the energy will, co will concentrate in the, in the U-part. Okay. And you have finitely many. Then you have a free wave. You have V of t. And then you have little o of 1 in h dot 1 cross L2. This is as time tends to infinity. V is a free wave, so it satisfies box V0. And it belongs to the energy class, h dot 1 cross L2. All right? 
Why is this energy class? Because that's H dot 1 cross L2, right? Not H1. H1 would mean that you would have a mass term plus U sitting there, which we will have to add subcritically. That's related to your question about scaling. Um, and what are these lambda j's? They're all positive. And they are, as one says, asymptotically orthogonal. So there is the, this symbol being used here. What does this mean? This means that if you divide this by that, you get 0 asymptotically as time tends to infinity, so all the way up to here. So if you draw a reverse light cone, then these profiles, as they're called w, they are somehow cuspidal. They propagate, they expand, if they expand at all, much more slowly. All right? So, uh, so I'm going to say, as I let the lambda, they're, they're growing, right? They're no, you don't know that. All you know is that their ratio, so this divided by that has to tend to infinity. This divided by that has to tend to infinity. Then the question was, can you construct examples with different types of behavior? And so, um, and depending on how those lambdas behave, is the thing going to be focusing or, or defocusing, right? I mean, it's going to be yeah. So Doninger and Krieger, just a few years ago, constructed largely because of this an example where you have type two finite time blow up at infinity. So where they used one bubble; these are called bubbles. Nobody really, well, Jacek Gendrich, who gave a talk here a few weeks ago, a few months ago, he described two bubbles. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, Doninger Krieger is one bubble, and they showed that you can construct a solution of this type with one lambda, and that lambda tends to zero in infinite time, so that you will have concentration of the energy, or rather, um, I always get confused, do I divide or multiply? So when I multiply the scale, I shrink, right? Yeah. So they, they showed that the energy can concentrate, uh, you can have concentration in such a picture in infinite time. So a whole range of complicated dynamics is possible here that we do not understand well. In DKM theory, in DKM theory, you know nothing other than that. Uh, nothing than that. There is no mechanism by which you control these lambdas. You just know that they have to separate. And this is very important because of this, you know that asymptotically the energy decomposes into a sum. It's like a Pythagoras theorem. Right. These guys will not know about each other asymptotically. So the energy becomes the energy of U is J times the energy of W0. So I put 0 here, you know, because W0 is in phase space the soliton plus the free energy, which is this thing here, V, it doesn't matter which time you use, this is a constant, H dot 1 cross L2 squared. You c so let's put 0. And this vanishes. So this becomes your decomposition of the energy. Right? Yes. That's the number of bumps. And this is a positive number, so therefore, so the energy is quantized if you want to. It can only come in, as far as these bubbles are concerned, it comes in quanta of this, and that limits the number of bubbles you can have, right? The energy of W, of w lambda is independent of lambda, right? Yes, yes, it's every that's it's scaling invariant. And the reason that you get this clean formula is because interaction between the dub these bu bumps that goes away infinity because the ratio of them is zero asymptotically, right? So I want to ask, we don't even know, there's no lower bound of lambda one, not even like the no. inverse power of t, exponentially uh, small, anything. Um, that's a subtle question. I think that critically we know really nothing about what this can be or not be, because the whole theory is scaling invariant, all right? Okay. But one remarkable result about this is that this was not known before they proved this characterization, is that you can't have 
an infinite time type 1 blow up. So in other words, the H1 cross L2 norm of U has to be uniformly bounded for all times. This was not known before. Sorry, what's the statement? That in H dot 1 cross L2, U remains in a finite ball. Right? Because if you compute the H dot 1 cross L2 norm of this, this doesn't depend on the lambdas. Mm -hmm. So you get J times that, mm -hmm. the H dot 1 norm of W, plus of this, which is constant in time, because that's the free energy of this thing. And this goes to 0. So therefore, you don't have infinite time finite time w type 1 blow up. You can only have infinite time type 2 blow up. And that you might have that. An example of this was constructed by Donninger and Krieger. All right? And so what they showed is this, that you can concentrate, the energy can concentrate in the tip of a light cone, but they also gave examples of the opposite phenomenon, where you get a pancake, where that spreads. So they, they gave a whole class, they, ho they constructed a whole class of um, such solutions. What's the third alternative? The third alternative, and allow me not to write this down in full detail, it looks just like this. You have the third one is type 2 finite time blow up. What's that? Finite time blow up. It means that you, ca you cannot extend the solution past some finite positive time in the sense of well positiveness theory, not in some w weak, weird sense. Okay, That's poorly understood, but Krieger also worked on such questions. But as a strong solution in the sense of well positiveness theory with finite Strichert's norms, as I had on the board. So you cannot extend beyond some finite time. But this <laughs> remains finite as you approach that time. All right, so it's a clear dichotomy. This is when it goes to infinity, type 1, when it remains bounded, type 2. If you have type 2 blow up, it has to be of this form. But now, in a reverse light cone, where there's blow up time, and so you have exactly this type of picture. You don't write v of t, because finite time. This approaches some fixed. The formula is just like this, but you replace that by a fixed pair of h dot 1 cross L2 functions. All right. and, and the blow up is governed by the, by the w. And you have exactly these, but now these lambda j's obey. Um, they will go to infinity right. um, in finite time. You get these types of pictures. OK. Yeah. That's the, the lambdas, uh, is there anything constraining the equation for lambda as a function of t? Not within this theory, so not in the DKM theory. There, it's a um, largely based on indirect arguments, not on ODEs, not on so-called modulation theory. There is no set of ODEs that governs the behavior of the lambda j's, and our expectation is, and we have papers about this with Krieg and Nakanishi and so on. So there's a entire theory um, that I can't do justice to here about what to expect even when you have just a single w. So the expectation is that lambda can be very um, erratic. The behavior of lambda is not under control. It could be, it could be chaotic or it, Who knows, OK? Who knows? That's, a, that's the topic of a separate talk, OK? <laughs> so I'm really not doing well on time. What happens subcritically? So subcritically, first of all, you want to box u. Let's take just the cubic case. <coughs> so why don't we just look at this equation? Well, because um, this does not have solutions in H1. In order for you to have solutions, you need to add a mass term. And then you have this type of um, equation. And this is known to have infinitely many solutions radially. All right. But when you do this, DKM theory completely breaks down. And the reason why it breaks down is because the key, I mean, there are many key ideas. This is quite a profound argument. It's not so easy to explain. But one key ingredient are so-called exterior energy estimates. 
Okay, so channel of energy method is what, first of all, the use of course concentration compactness, which is our only um, cannon that we have, a weapon for large data. But in addition, they need to separate, how do you separate radiation from solitons? How do you do that? We have no means of doing this uh, as of now for Schrödinger. Because Schrödinger, um, you have complicated dispersion relation, right? For different frequencies, wave packets move at different speeds, you get some crazy mess. But for this wave equation, you know that you have propagation speed exactly one. And so a key ingredient in this DKM theory is that you're able to separate the radiation from things that kind of sit um, more sta in a more stationary fashion. And if you compute the energy, so grad u, first of all, you take the radial free wave equation in three dimensions, what could be easier? And you compute this at time t and x, so t. But let's first do this. So I'm drawing here the origin. And I'm drawing a light cone, and then I'm excising the light cone. So I look at things outside. And this, by local energy identity, this is a decreasing function of time. And as you compute that limit, either in the forward or backward time, you get, get at least 50% of the initial energy. So that's one half of integral grad u squared ut squared 0x dx over r3. What's the logic? Well, your data are either to 50% incoming or outgoing. If they're outgoing, then you do this. This is a maximum of a plus minus. You do this in the forward direction. Right? So this is easier for solutions of the free wave. Free radial wave equation. OK, wave. radial. Um, and if 50% of your data are incoming, then you do it in backward time, because in backward time becomes outgoing. This is a whole story in and of itself. And it's is it channel, is it channel, is it what this is channels of energy. If you move, if you make R positive, you might think that you would have this. That's in fact false because of the Newton potential. The Newton potential, one over R, <laughs> is a solution of the free wave equation in this exterior region which is not in h dot 1 of r3 because of the singularity at the origin. But if you excise that, it is an h dot 1 cross L2 solution in such an exterior region. And therefore, its exterior energy, of course, that's 0 for the Newton potential. You look perplexed. No, okay. 1 over r, right? You agree with me. 1 over r is a solution of the free wave equation in this exterior region. By the way, as a remark, it's very important that this is a 45 degree angle, which I should have said, that's exactly the characteristics, sure. right? If you try to talk about a solution exterior to a cylinder to the wave equation, I don't know what this is. I don't know what that means. But as long as you give me a light cone, you can always take away a light cone from me, and I still know what the solution to the wave equation outside of that is. But for a cylinder, I because, right? You have characteristics, you have fine propagation speed. So for Newton potential, this is 0, whereas this is not 0. So something's missing when you turn on R. And so what's missing is that you can't do this. Instead, you look at u0, u1. But you have to project perpendicular to the Newton potential h dot 1 cross L2, but absolute x bigger than r. So this replaces this, replaces that. And then you can do it. Then you can do it. And for r equals 0, um, you don't need this. And originally, in the original formulation of DKM, Deutsch's kinetic male, it, it didn't appear like that. It didn't appear with this projection perpendicular to the Newton potential. Instead, what they had is r u r squared plus r u t squared. They just noticed that in three dimensions, if you take a radial free wave, you multiply by r, you get a one-dimensional wave. 
You use the Lambert formula method of characteristics. But it turns out that that thing, which is not the same as this, it is the same for r equals 0. But for r positive, it's actually that. Because you pick up an interaction term, you integrate by parts, yeah, you get exactly that. Right? Now, that's all very nice, but it turns out to be extremely non-robust. If you switch to Klein-Gordon, which you have to subcritically, what do the characteristics do? They all move inside. <laughs> because for Klein-Gordon, the speed of propagation is less than 1. And I spent two days calculating this exterior energy, and I ended up with equal 0. And then I felt like an idiot, because a physicist would not have made this mistake. For Klein-Gordon, the dispersion relation is, so for wave, the dispersion relation is omega c, depending on the frequency, is this. For Klein-Gordon, it is Japanese psi, which is root 1 plus length psi squared. Then what you need to do is you compute the gradient. And for Klein-Gordon, that's always less than 1. For wave, of course, that gradient is always equal to 1. <laughs> so physicists would have immediately known that the asymptotic exterior energy for Klein-Gordon is always 0. So we don't have a DKM argument. It completely is dead from the, from the get-go. Okay? Because you cannot separate the radiation from any kind of solid. It completely depends on that in ways that I cannot get into. Okay, so maybe how Gias gave lectures here about that when he was here because how Gia yeah, yeah. he used yeah. that we and about that a few times. and he and I used it in some joint work that I actually meant to discuss here, but I'm really doing spectacularly badly on time. Um, yeah, so because we don't have any tools for the Hamiltonian subcritical equation, we went to the dissipative case. So not you lose the Hamiltonian property. And what I'm discussing now is joint work with Nicola Burg and Geneviève, Geneviève Rochelle. They're both in Orsay at Paris 11. And so we didn't look at the subcritical Klein-Gordon. We looked at the okay, And so we added that. Think of it in the same way you go from the harmonic oscillator to the damped harmonic oscillator. This one has conserved energy, of course, which is 1 half x dot squared plus omega squared x squared, right? If I'm not mistaken, that's a constant for the harmonic oscillator. That's the phase portrait. For this, this energy is not constant, because if you take the derivative of that, you get negative 2 alpha x dot squared. So the energy decreases in time, or is constant. That's exactly what. Um, so let me get rid of the ODE. We does he have the similar behavior for the PDE? So, so getting back to this other one, the, the, the cubic one with the Klein Gordon cube. It's included. So you know, you know, since it's defocusing, you do know that there's a blow up, right? It is focusing, so you might have blow up. So you, you yes. know that you can arrange the blow up. Yes, 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 yes. You have. You can construct the same type of ODE yeah. blow up that we have. Yeah. Just the so power changes. The the power becomes but minus but one. You just don't know how the law occurs so precisely. Ah, OK. Yeah, so the expectation is here that only type 1 blow up is possible. So only the ODE type blow up. And their results, deep results, complicated results, by Mel and Hatim Zag. But I'm not sure. They might be able to cover power 3. I'm quite sure they can. This is the conformal power in three dimensions. But they can't go above. All right? So they can't cover the range from 3 to 5. Mm -hmm. But 3 and below, they can prove to you that the only t blow up that's possible for this is type is 1. It's type, type 1. Okay? So type 2 is an extra phenomenon that you get in the critical equation. Okay? Now, let me mention just for completeness that Nakanishi and I, so there is a special 
stationary solution, which is the ground state. There is a unique radio positive solution to this. And the uniqueness is not easy. Mm -hmm. Those were research papers in the 60s, Kaufman, Serin, um, Kwong. People have studied uniqueness. And if you start messing with this nonlinearity, it, it's either false or not known that you have uniqueness of ground states. Um, so what Nakanishi and I proved, let me just draw a picture, is if you take the ground state, and if you take the energy only slightly bigger than the ground state, then you have the following picture. I will draw a more restrictive picture. I will stay near the ground state in phase space. This point is Q0, in which topology? In H1 cross L2 of R3. Our theorem works in um, greater generality. All right? You can take any dimension, basically, any subcritical nonlinearity. Um, then if you take a small enough ball in infinite dimensions, there exists this co-dimension one, smooth manifold, or at least Lipschitz manifold, depending on what kind of nonlinearity you have, which separates this ball into two halves, co-dimension one, right? And where does co-dimension one come from? It comes from the fact that if you linearize this equation, you have minus Laplace plus one minus three Q squared. This operator L has a unique negative eigenvalue. So it has negative spectrum, but that only one eigenvalue. And therefore, if you look near um, Q0, then of course you have an exponentially growing mode coming from the negative eigenvalue, right? So therefore you will have a one-dimensional unbounded, sorry, unstable manifold. You have a one-dimensional stable manifold. You have a co-dimension one center stable manifold, which is exactly that. It separates this ball into two halves. Upstairs, you have finite time blow up. Below it, you have scattering to the vacuum, all right, to zero. All the energy ca is carried off to infinity. But if you happen, which is probability zero, if you happen to start exactly on this center stable manifold, then you scatter to Q0. So asymptotically, the solution becomes Q0 plus radiation, which is soliton resolution. All right, For, so subcritically we know soliton resolution, at least radially, provided the energy is not much bigger than the energy of the ground state. Yeah, stay near the we don't have for all energies. But with Birk and Rogel, if you allow us to add a little bit of dissipation, so our first theorem, which is from two years ago, if you give me any alpha, then so you look at all, this is radial, if you look at all, um, I'm not much about this f. And the reason is we assume very little on this f. We assume a so-called um, Rabinovitz, Ambrosetti Rabinovitz condition, which I can just write down for the sake of completeness. It will look a little bit mysterious. We ask that there exists, it's a sign condition, which you can interpret as a defocusing, uh, sorry, a focusing assumption. So this is in, we have to be in dimension one, between one and six. The six is a technical um, restriction having to do with Strich's estimates. But you want that the primitive of your nonlinearity, which is assumed to be odd and enough regular, which means basically some C1 alpha condition. So this is the primitive that vanishes at zero, and this vanishes at zero. So think of u cubed if you want to, all right? But we work in, we don't have a result like DKM where you can put alpha equals zero. But we have alpha positive, but we have a very robust theory that applies to any type of nonlinearity, basically, as long as it's subcritical. We have to be obviously subcritical relative to H1. And then we have soliton resolution. Let me just say it in words, because I'm kind of out of time. It says that any radial solution to this either blows up in finite time, or it converges exponentially because of the damping to one of the stationary guys. And the way we originally proved this is by invariant manifold theory. You have to really go to the literature. And Rochelle is a great expert on, say, the Jack Hale School. Oh she, yeah. she worked with Jack Hale. Yeah. 
And so we used Chen Hill 10, which is in infinite dimensions, near an equilibrium, a theorem about these existence these of four. Right? Yes. So, and more, you have an in a foliation by invariant manifolds. You have the so called asymptotic phase property, whatever this is. And so, the latest theorem, which is went on archive a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, is where we allow this alpha to tend to zero in time. And then we could not, we were not able to use invariant manifold theory. It might be that, but everything becomes non-autonomous, right? So we, in our second paper, we allowed this, but alpha. Um, cannot be bigger than a third. It would be wonderful to get all the way to A equals 1, which would be the critical case. The minimal assumption you have to make on your alpha is that its integral is infinite. This is the minimal assumption, because if this is finite, you can take the term to the right-hand side, and then your perturbation of the Hamiltonian case. So to have the true damping effect, you need this to be infinite. So A equals 1 would be great. We don't know this. We only know it um, in full generality when A is less than a third. And then we have the same type of theorem. Either you blow up in finite time or you converge, not exponentially, but sub-exponentially, to one of the stationary guys radially. So we have solid and resolution for this, if you want, weakly damped equation. All right? And I'm happy to explain the details to anyone who cares. What we use here is not, as I said, not um, Jack Hale invariant manifold theory. We use the so-called, how do I spell this? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Wojasiewicz Simon inequality. Wojasiewicz Simon inequality. Note that we. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, no. more details to anyone who cares. <laughs> <laughs>